if we take any lesson away from, from the Bush and Obama years, it's to say that trying to force people into doing stuff that they don't want to do is just not a fruitful path for the federal government. It's going to be expensive, it's going to be difficult, and it's rarely going to work out. Mike McShane, you're the director of national research at EdChoice. You've got an affiliation with AEI. Yes, I do. We've tackled this work together for years as friends, and we've got a new book out. We do. Bush Obama School Reform Lessons Learned. Absolutely. Bush Obama School, it sounds weird to talk <laughs> Isn't about. Isn't it weird? Bush Obama. How, how do we possibly justify that? I mean, these were two pretty different presidencies. They were sort of, but education is something that they had in common. I think a lot of the, the themes, policies were relatively similar. Some of the kind of the ideology or philosophy behind it were, were similar as well. So I, I was actually surprised. I think when, when you and I were thinking about this project, we were wondering whether some of the authors that we recruited would say, oh, they were, they were very different from one another and we'd have to think about how to link them. But overwhelmingly, folks found a, a significant number of through seams through both administrations. So talk about this a little bit, especially for somebody who was, I don't know, like in third grade yeah. during the Bush years. Like when you say there were similarities sure. between Bush school reform and Obama school reform, what, what, what's that mean? I think of a couple things. So first, I would say if there was maybe one word that summed up the, the federal approach during this era, it was accountability. So the Bush administration with no child left behind, which I think if it was passed at the end of 2001, I was like a junior in high school. So I wasn't <laughs> in third grade, but I was, I was close. It was all about uh, testing students and determining their performance towards goals of universal proficiency and holding schools accountable as to whether or not they were meeting those goals. And the Obama administration was really about kind of expanding that. So they both expanded how that was measured. So they looked at the standards with, with efforts like the Common Core to try and change what the standards for judging, how to hold schools accountable. And they also expanded the who. So they looked at um, teachers as well. So not only do we want to hold schools or districts accountable, but we want to drive that down all the way to the teacher in the classroom. So I think from a policy perspective, that kind of accountability arc is something that, that united both of the, the administrations. And I think that from that kind of philosophical or ideological lens, I think we really saw the triumph of this idea of education as a civil rights issue or as a civil rights crusade. It was something that in the Bush years, I think sort of pushed Republicans who generally speaking aren't necessarily interested in expanding the role of the federal government, particularly with something like, um, like education. Um, and it really was a shot in the arm for the, the liberals of the Obama administration to, to really ramp up their, their efforts in America's schools. So we'll dig into this a bit, but let's start real broad. So Bush Obama school reform lessons learned. Yeah. What are a couple of the key things we've learned out of 16 years of these Sure. Efforts. I mean, I think so one, one takeaway, one lesson learned was that the federal government's reach kind of exceeded its grasp. Um, we have a big, diverse, sprawling education system, what north of 14,000 school districts and 100,000 schools and millions of teachers and tens of millions of students. And so it's just really difficult for Washington to be able to set policies that work in everywhere from Bangor, Maine to San Jose, California to you know, Alaska to Miami, Florida, right? Um, but, uh, and, and so a lot of people take that away from, I think, this time period, which is to say that, you know, the, the thumb was too heavy on the federal scale. It bred backlash and things like standardized testing or national standards, which if you go back to some polling kind of before the Bush Obama years were generally, generally kind of positive. People, people, had a, people had a positive view of those. But I think it's also important to not lose in that kind of top line summary that there were some positive developments that are, that are worth celebrating. And one of them was this incredible infrastructure that was created. So in order to hold schools accountable, states and districts have had to collect an enormous amount of information student test scores, graduation rates, funding, all, you know, all of this stuff that we looked into that we can now use to make better decisions about policies. Ironically, uh, some of these things, the way we know policies didn't work was because of this infrastructure that the policies created, right? <laughs> um, and I think the, the, the same thing is true with teacher evaluation and others. So maybe that evaluation piece went a little too far, was a little unwieldy, didn't necessarily yield but what we wanted, but the types of research and policy analysis that we're going to be able to do, I think will have long-term positive repercussions. So while we know that so many Americans get fired up about 
high quality policy analysis. Oh yeah, they you love know, it. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a victory. But, I mean, a lot of people have got to say, well, Mike, but I, I hear you saying Washington's reach exceeded its grasp. Sure. That a lot of this stuff didn't seem to work. But like, what's the takeaway there that Washington should try to make it easier to do high quality policy analysis and otherwise just leave kids and families to kind of wish for the best? No, I think it's that the, the Washington's got to focus on what it can do well. So I think that there are things that the federal government can do to support the people who are actually educating kids, right? The people who are actually in schools and even local policymakers, state superintendents, boards of education and others. I mean, there's a really great chapter in the book, Bob Pianta and Tara Hopkins. Um, Bob is the, the dean of the School of Education at the University of Virginia, who does this deep dive into research and, and both lauds the Bush administration and the Obama administration and their commitment to doing high quality education research. And, and, and I think really frames helpful that this is something that, that the federal government can do well and that can have real positive impacts on children. The more we can learn about how kids learn, what policies can be effective, I think can actually have long-term positive impacts. Okay, so if one positive lesson is that Washington can make a big difference in terms of research and this infrastructure, what are the other things we take away from the Bush Obama years that Washington has a constructive role to play? So I think um, there's a great chapter in the book by Anne Galate of NC State where she looks specifically into the issue of charter schooling and school choice. I mean, there we saw the federal government take a different tack. Rather than playing a role in sort of requiring states to advance charter schools, um, they did a lot of work trying to create funds that can help people start new charter schools, help charter schools get access to credit. So sort of empowering those people that are working on the ground, not really telling them what to do. Um, there was a little bit around, you know, the types of schools that were likely to be able to get that. But generally speaking, it was a much more hands-off approach, trying to support and sustain what's already going on, as opposed to trying to force it from Washington. So, I mean, it seems like the obvious downside of that approach is that there's some states where the anti-charter community is really powerful. Sure. And offering them resources, they say, no, thank you. Yeah. So w w that, that seems like an obvious limitation to that kind of Sure. Approach. What's the upside of that kind of approach? Well, so the upside approach to that is that fundamentally, I think for education policies to work, you have to have these local coalitions of people. People on the ground have to, you can't have outside people sort of force this. So trying to support places that have developed this, I think will be much more fruitful than trying to force it in places that don't. So you're just sort of burning money and spinning wheels trying to get people who don't want to do something to do something. A wise person told me once that the federal government can get people to do stuff, but it can't get them to do it well. He said, reminds me roughly your description. No, I think that that's, that's that. So, so I think that's a, that's a really important lesson of this time period is to say that, look, we can get paper compliance. We can get people to check boxes and, and do this sort of stuff. But if we want them to engage in the real work of creating great schools, it's got to be sort of a local effort that maybe the federal government can help support, but it's got to be the, the sort of back seat, not in the front seat. Well, it, you know, in, in the book, we Devin Carlson writes about yeah. accountability. Uh, Brookings Tom Lovelace writes about standards <laughs> in the Common Core. So, so make, help me understand the comparison, or I guess the contrast. So what you're talking about with charter schools is Washington offered money. Sure. Um, and states could do it or not do it. And that seems like it was a useful way to support um, charter growth in a bunch of states. Sure. Wouldn't some of the advocates, say, of the Common Core, say that that's all they were doing, was they were trying to offer support and resources for states that wanted to do it? Why did that seem to play out? in a different fashion. I mean, it seemed like the, the federal government put their thumb on the scale much more for the Common Core than they probably did for some of these other policy efforts. So you had Race to the Top. It was a, a large section of having these unified standards as well as the assessments that are tied to them. Um, and in the sort of regulatory waivers that were part of No Child Left Behind, changing your standards was a really big part of those as well. And this is, I mean, it's, I think it's a really fascinating contrast, right? Because, um, you know, as we said earlier, I think there was polling and reason to believe that this idea of national standards or even kind of national tests was a generally 
positively viewed uh, effort. People thought that, that that might actually be a good idea going back to, to before this. And I think, frankly, you know, if there's like a, an alternate scenario where the federal government doesn't necessarily set its thumbs so hard on the scale for the Common Core, it could have played out a lot differently. If rather having sort of individual states adopt these these policies and learning from one another and sort of happening in fits and then starts over a longer period of time, I think we maybe have a different outcome from it. But you know, we saw adoption of the Common Core by, what was it, 45 states in the District of Columbia in like 12 or 18 months or something. And you had states that just had no business doing it. They had no capacity to do it, but they were chasing federal dollars at the height of the Great Recession. And so, like, it's hard to, like, I think, and I think it's important to take away from our book, I would, I, I imagine you'd agree with me on this one. We're not trying to look back and sort of cast a lot of blame or say this, like, look, if I was a governor of, or a state superintendent of education and someone said, you can get a couple hundred million dollars while I'm hemorrhaging, <laughs> worried about hemorrhaging teachers, it's like not an entirely unreasonable thing to do. But when it comes to actually creating like a durable infrastructure to make sure this stuff works and to integrate it into all the other stuff you're trying to do, teacher evaluation, school accountability, technology, all that stuff that was happening, you just can't, you can't do that on the quick and you can't do that on the cheap. So there is this timeline effect, right? Yeah, when you try sure. to push this stuff out of Washington, folks have to do everything <laughs> within kind of a four-year window. For sure. Because presidents want to get reelected. Totally. And, and, and so part of the problem here then is that if you're trying to do Common Core and teacher evaluation and accountability and school improvement all at once. Sure. So you, you get complicated. You know, a, a, a related point is you mentioned Annie Galatea's chapter before. And actually, this seems relevant to, say, the Trump administration, and Petsy DeVos's advocacy for choice. Sure is one of the things Anna points out in the book is because charters were not driven from Washington, you could have very different looking coalitions in different states. For sure. Whereas on something like Common Core, folks working in red states were getting hung up by their ankles for things that were said by Obama totally. officials in Washington. How does that translate when we think about, say, Betsy DeVos trying to promote school choice nationally out of Washington? Are there lessons we can take oh, for from sure. those from the earlier efforts? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, that's the thing is right now, I think if we're specifically talking about something like private school choice, you know, it exists in 20 or 21 states right now. I think there's more than 60 individual programs that, that already exist. And generally, they exist in states where the people want them to be there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if you have these coalitions of people who are working in these states who want this thing, supporting them, helping them, getting them together to share ideas, or maybe even breaking up some funding streams and stuff to accelerate what they're doing is a whole lot different than saying, oh yeah, we want to pass some uniform federal program that anybody, even in states that don't want to do this, can do it. I mean, I just, th I just feel like if we take any lesson away from, from the Bush and Obama years, it's to say that, that we've got to look at trying to force people into doing stuff that they don't want to do is just not a fruitful path for the federal government. It's going to be expensive, it's going to be difficult, and it's rarely going to work out. But now Washington does this sometimes. I mean, this was the Affordable Care Act. Sure. This was, uh, you know, raising the drinking, raising the drinking age sure. for highway funds. So is it that it never works to make states do things, or are there certain kinds of reforms or is education distinctive in this? Yeah, no, I mean, I think in, in many cases, the problem with doing this in education is that we have serious disagreements about what it means to give a child a quality education, what it means to be a great school or to be a great teacher. And these are debates that we have to have with one another, generally sort of within communities or in sort of smaller groups of people. It's difficult to have one kind of uniform national conversation about what well, these Give me an example. Are. I mean, like you and I, I think most people would agree, like good schools, kids are learning to read, write, their teachers are like engaging. So like, what do we disagree about? Well, I mean, I think we, we disagree even, it falls apart very quickly. So something like math, we want kids to know math. Well, like, what does that mean, right? Do we want them to know algebra? Do we want them to know algebra in eighth grade? Or do we want them to know algebra in ninth grade? We want them to be able to read, but like, what do we want them to read? Do we want them to read fiction texts and great works of literature? Do we want them to read nonfiction texts and then user manuals for a fax machine, or right? So so I think we do have these well, kind of- Well, nobody wants to read user manuals. I, I don't know, maybe they do, right? <laughs> but like, right, so, so I think that we have these bromides of like, we want a great teacher in every 
classroom or we want kids that can do that, but, but it falls apart very, very quickly. So, you know, you mentioned back at the beginning of our conversation about the role civil rights play sure. uh, in this push, especially around accountability. Um, Josh Dunn does a really interesting oh, yeah. chapter in the book. Could you talk a bit about what we learned maybe about how the civil rights emphasis plays out? Sure. So, I mean, framing education as a civil rights issue, which we can say politicians from across the political spectrum over the course of the last 15 or 20 years have, have done, can really be a powerful kind of arrow in the quiver of, of education reformers to unite people from different ideological backgrounds and get them fired up about improving educational opportunities for kids. And I think that it's important for us to think about in historical terms the, the, the children in the community that have been um, discriminated against and that have had their opportunities circumscribed because of their race, because of their income, or because, because of those issues. So it's this powerful tool that can unite people and unites us to, I think, really proud history, proud parts of our American history, the civil rights movement and other issues. That said, um, there are some downsides to viewing education uh, as a civil rights issue. One of them that we were just sort of speaking about is that we have disagreement about what exactly it means. Previous civil rights issues where maybe someone was the question of whether or not they should be allowed to vote or whether or not they should allow, be allowed to get married, that's kind of a, a one zero outcome, right? Either someone can vote or someone can't vote. Someone can get married or they can't get married. It's very clear when that right is being violated and it's reasonably clear what the remedy uh, should be. Education is a lot more complicated. And so having this discussion of if we say that it's a, a civil right of every child to have a qualified teacher in their classroom, like, what does that mean? How do we measure it? If the, a child isn't getting one of those, what is the remedy? I think the really interesting thing that Josh talks about in that chapter is that for every right, there must be a remedy if, if it's not being uh, met. And the other thing that I think is, is sort of elided in so many of these discussions is that treating education as the civil rights issue, while it is this powerful tool to try and unite people around uh, this vision, really raises the stakes. And so much of public policy, making good policy, is about making alterations and making changes and, and altering course. Like, oh, well, you know, we, we defined a quality teacher in this way, but we're learning a little bit more, and so we need to change it this way. Or we need to, this is what a quality school is, or this is how it needs to change. Well, admit it, you've got your foot on the gas of this sort of civil rights crusade. It makes compromise a lot more difficult. It makes course changing much more difficult because it's like, oh wait a second, like, no, you can't do that anymore. You're denying a child their civil right. Or you are, um, you know, you're standing in the way of this, this movement. If you want to be a person who's just reasonable, says like, I don't know if we've actually got this like teacher evaluation system worked out yet. And so I don't think we want to start using that to justify whether or not kids' rights are being violated, just I th which I think is a reasonable thing to want to say. You can be cast as a person, it's like, oh, well, you just don't like kids or you don't believe in their potential or something. You're like, no, I just, I just don't know if we've got this system worked out yet. So I think there was a real downside that it silenced a lot of needed debate and discussion and it caused people to kind of circle the wagons when they should have been a little bit more open to saying, this isn't working out exactly the way that we wanted to and so we need to change course. Mm. All right. Let's close with this. We started, you talked about maybe the big idea that we saw in the Bush Obama years was accountability. Yeah. Um, and so maybe just close, what have we learned about educational accountability for schools, for teachers, either in Washington or the states? If there's one or two things viewers should really think, we know this now about educational accountability that maybe we didn't know back in 2000. What sure. Is it? So I think a couple things. So one would be that if you hold people accountable for particular metrics, they will focus on improving those metrics, right? So if we say we're going to hold the school accountable based on reading and math scores, those schools will organize themselves and organize their efforts to increase reading and math scores. Um, uh, same thing might be true with teachers and others. But um, you want to be really careful about those metrics that you that you pick because in a they may not be the sum total of what you want out of schools and if that's the only thing that you're judging school performance on you could leave out a whole lot of important stuff and b it should be really important that those metrics can't be easily gamed 
I mean, I think we see a lot of issues of kind of what we, we might call like a soft gaming of, you know, spending more time on these particular issues or changing the way uh, of instruction to maximize test scores as opposed to maybe some kind of deeper learning that kids have. And even kind of more hard gaming of cheating or of, you know, other sort of nefarious deeds that were done. So I think thinking about being very clear that if you want a small set of metrics or any set of metrics to guide what's going on in schools, people will find a way to move those numbers, sometimes ethically, sometimes not ethically, and that could have knock-on effects that, that last far beyond um, what you might expect. Mm. Mike, thank you for a riveting conversation. Hey, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to Always have you, Always a pleasure, friend. man. Hey, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Mike McShane. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, remember to like the video or leave us a comment. And be sure to check out the rest of our videos and research from AEI.